Not everything you find in a museum comes with detailed explanation of what it is, who built it, and for what reason. We've discovered many artifacts over the years that are difficult to explain in both form and function. In some cases, we know how they were built, but not who made them or why. In some cases, even the method of creating the artifact is lost on us, and its whole existence is a mystery. This is a video about strange historic curiosities. We can tell you everything there is to know about this first item apart from what it was used for. It comes from somewhere between 1279 and 1213 BCE, and it was once in the personal possession of Nefertari, who was once the queen of ancient Egypt. It's an ornate lenticular box, and a lot of time and effort went into its construction. There's a lid on top which opens and closes, and all around it is delicately carved circles. Right on the top is a tiny sculpture of a hedgehog. In Egyptian mythology, the hedgehog is a symbol of death and rebirth, which seems to sit at odds with the popular theory that this was an ungent box used to store cosmetics such as eyeliner. A makeup box doesn't have any apparent connotations when it comes to birth or death. And so the presence of the hedgehog poses a question that doesn't appear to have any answers. It's possible that Nefertiri kept her makeup in here and used the box to ensure she always looked beautiful to her husband, Ramses II. But it's just as possible it had another use that we don't understand. Staying in ancient Egypt for the moment, it is commonly accepted fact that cats were held in particular reverence in the country during times of antiquity. That does not, however, fully explain the existence of decorative cat busts, such as this one, from somewhere around the year 600 BCE. Cats were considered sacred to the deity Bastet, and as such, they were often afforded ceremonial burials. Sculptures like these may have had a role in the burial ceremonies, but they appear to be incomplete. Many Egyptologists have expressed the belief that the cat heads would be placed on wooden sarcophagi with the mummified remains of the deceased cat inside. It's a solid theory, but it has drawbacks. No evidence of the wooden sarcophagi has ever been found, even inside unopened tombs where wood should have been reasonably well preserved. If the official theory is wrong, then we don't have an adequate explanation as to why the Egyptians carved so many cat head statues, and perhaps we never will. If you think that the idea of having special drinking vessel intended only for use by infants is a relatively recent one, you might be very wrong. If researchers and archaeologists are correct about what they found in Turkey in January 2020, it might be a practice as old as civilization itself. These fragile drinking vessels, which turned up during the dig in Bingol in the east of the country, are approximately four and a half thousand years old, and the people who found them think that they're a primitive type of baby bottle. The tiny clay bottles, of which three were found, can hold between 50 to 150 milligrams of liquid each. The dig has been ongoing for some time, and the baby bottles were only discovered at the very bottom of the site. Ancient baby bottles have been found before elsewhere in the world, but the oldest known vessels prior to this were made about 2,000 years ago. Almost brand new compared to this trio. If the finding is verified, it will force us to think again about the way our ancient ancestors raised their young. The next discovery was found in 2008, but it's so sensational that it wasn't made public until 2016. It's a collection of lead scrolls created more than 2,000 years ago, and they contain the very first ever recorded mention of Jesus Christ. Chemical analysis of the material has been carried out and confirmed the age of the scrolls, which were found in a cave in Jordan. There are even drawings of Jesus inside the book, which some historians believe may have been made while he was alive. Interestingly, although the content of the scrolls appears to be devoted to Christ, there are also Jewish and Paleo-Hebrew symbols on some of the pages, suggesting a possible plurality of belief systems in either the author of the scripts or the society they lived in. What makes the words of the text especially interesting is that they appear to contradict popular Christian beliefs. They make reference to a God who is both male and female. 
and also explicitly state that Christ was trying to restore a thousand-year-old religion rather than starting one of his own. It's a hugely controversial discovery, but it's the real deal. If you have a household pet, you've probably fit it with a collar to help ensure that it can be returned to you if it ever escapes or gets lost. You might even have written a message on the collar to ensure that whoever finds the pet can contact you easily. Somewhat disturbingly, it now seems that the ancient Romans once did the same with their slaves. A recent addition to the Museo Nazionale Romano in Italy is a neck ring made of iron, onto which is secured a bronze tag. The inscription on the tag reads, Fuji tene mi cum revauc averes mi domino meo zonio asipis solidium. We realize that that will have meant nothing to the majority of you, so we'll translate it. It says, I have run away. Restrain me. When you bring me back to my master, Zonius, you shall be given a gold coin. It seemed too fantastical to be genuine, but the museum insists that it has been tested and confirmed to be an authentic artifact from around the 4th century. We suppose it's more of a humane alternative to the other methods of identifying slaves that went on back then, which included forcibly tattooing their faces. Some of the most well-known important archaeological sites in the world are so huge and so complex that we still haven't extracted all of their secrets, even with over 100 years spent searching them. The existence of the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico is hardly a secret, and yet the mask that was found inside the pyramid in January 2020 came as a complete surprise to the archaeologists who have spent their whole professional careers studying it. The mask was found among a cache of treasures at the end of a 380-foot tunnel dug by researchers during the 1930s, but then forgotten about. The green serpentine mask is strikingly realistic and is quite unlike anything that's come from the area in or around the pyramid before. Because it was found in the foundation layers of the pyramid, one theory is that the mask was used during a ritual to mark the commencement of the pyramid's construction and then left there as an offering. It sounds like a detailed theory, but it's really just a guess. And it has to be a guess because we still don't even know who built Teotihuacan, let alone what kind of ceremonies they may or may not have had. Look very closely at this beautiful sculpture. Note how intricate and detailed it is, and how every single detail of it is perfectly formed. Even using a magnifying glass and modern tools, it would be very difficult for an artisan to make this by hand today. We have no idea how someone managed to carve it from a single olive stone as long ago as 1737. We do, however, know who that someone was. It was the Chinese artist Chen Tzu Chang, who lived during the Qing Dynasty. His work is astonishing. Even the tiny figures on the boat have unique facial expressions, and the windows open and close. To make things even more impressive, there are 300 characters of text engraved on the boat's hull, representing a poem by the Chinese writer Su Shi. Su Chang must have had hands of stone to be able to carve into something so small with such accuracy and precision. If the boat didn't exist as evidence that he'd made it, we'd believe his achievement to be impossible. The very concept of a bazaar is difficult to explain. To see them now, you'd think of them as a beautiful pieces of jewelry, fit to be worn by royals. And it's true that royals did once use them. There's nothing regal about their origins, though. They're made of indigestible material found in the guts of deceased animals and humans, and were worn inside jewelry as charms in the mistaken belief that they would act as a guard against being poisoned. They were also thought to have medicinal properties and would sometimes be ground up and put into drinks. More often than not, the wealthy person who bought a bazaar didn't even know what they were buying. They were told it was something fanciful, such as crystallized tears of a deer. The practice is thought to have begun with Persians or Greek doctors in the first century, but became briefly fashionable in Europe during the 16th. Queen Elizabeth I of England is known to have had a small one set into a silver ring she wore every day. 
By the 18th century, medical knowledge had advanced to the point where the nonsense of the supposed function had become apparent. The Broider Gold Hoard has been the source of disagreement between Ireland and Britain ever since it was discovered in Lamavity, Northern Ireland, in the final years of the 19th century. It's thought that it had been hidden below grounds for hundreds of years before it was accidentally unearthed by farmers Thomas Nicoll and James Morrow as they plowed their field in 1896. The items that made up the hoard were quickly split between the men and their families and sold in many different directions. It's only when the British Museum acquired some of them and confirmed that they were 2,000 years old that their real value became apparent. And so, when British Crown tried to claim all of the treasures as its own, a very long argument began. Away from the arguing, people were trying to work out the significance of the Golden Boat, which was a very odd sculpture even by the standards of its era. It's now thought that the boat may be a votive offering to an obscure Irish god called Mananin Mechlir, the god of the sea. If so, it's the only such votive offering of its kind ever discovered. Over the years, there have been many archaeological discoveries that initially appeared to be real but were later proved to be fakes. It's less common that something initially presumed to be fake eventually turns out to be real. But that's what happened with this 17th century book. That's not the only thing that's odd about it. It isn't really a book at all. It's actually a tiny cabinet full of labeled drawers, all of which are said to have once housed a different type of poison. The etching of the skeleton on the inner cover of the cabinet feels a little hokey and adds to the sense that what you were looking at isn't real. But based on the size and shape of the drawers, there's every reason to believe that it is exactly what it appears to be. At the very least, we can confirm that it is as old as it claims to be. It was made somewhere around the year 1682. 17th century medicine was very similar to 17th century poisoning. Often, the only difference was the dosage. That means that the book could have belonged to a doctor just as easily as it could have belonged to an assassin and will likely never know which is right. It isn't just the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico that still gives up the occasional mystery artifact. England's Stonehenge can still occasionally surprise us too. In October 2013, a mysterious object known as the Golden Lozenge of Stonehenge went on display for the first time. And anybody who claims to know precisely what it is, is a liar. Even the circumstances of its discovery are shrouded in mystery. Archaeologist William Cunnington claimed to have found it in a burial mound half a mile from Stonehenge, a site known as Bush Barrow today. Inside the barrow, he found the skeleton of a man he named the King of Stonehenge, and on the skeleton, the lozenge fixed to his chest as if it were a breastplate. The thin golden plate displays incredible craftsmanship considering it was made 4,000 years ago, and the decorative lines and shapes on it suggest an intricate knowledge of both geometry and mathematics that we don't readily associate with the people of that era. It's a truly unique and utterly incomprehensible historical artifact. If you've ever wondered what Roman aristocrats did to pass the time between drinking wine and hosting parties, well, wonder no longer. Apparently, they were playing games using dice towers like this one, which was discovered almost exactly in between the villages of Freutzheim and Wettweiss in Germany in 1985. Based on the inscriptions, it may even have been a birthday gift. The text on one side celebrates a presumably recent military victory over the Picts. On the other side, conveys good wishes to the gift's recipient. To be precise, it says, use this and live luckily which is fairly blunt as goodwill messages go. Perhaps the Romans weren't big on sentiment. It's a remarkably complicated structure given its trivial use. Dice would be dropped in at the top and plunged through three levels before emerging down the steps at the bottom, ringing bells on their way out. While we understand what it does, we don't have any information about the type of game it was used to play. The Romans definitely didn't sit around tables playing Monopoly, so what was this cute dice thrower used for? Subscribe to the channel 
turn on the notification bell and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.